Welcome to tonight's talk with Spike Trotman. I'm Melanie Korn, president of Columbus College of Art and Design. We're so pleased to sponsor tonight's discussion and are happy to have been part of CXC since the beginning. I know that many of you watching already know about CCAD, but for those who don't, allow me to tell you a little bit about us. CCAD is one of the oldest nonprofit art and design colleges in the United States. We were founded in 1879 by five women and now have over a thousand students across 12 BFA and one MFA programs. Our mission, similar to CXC's, is to foster a community that educates diverse students so they can unleash their creative power to shape culture and commerce. Graduates from our comics and narrative practice program go on to work as independent artists, writers, publishers, comics illustrators, colorists, letterers, storyboard artists, and character developers for comics, animation, gaming, and toys. I could go on, but I'm going to stop here and let Lauren McCubbin, chair of both CCAD's illustration and comics and narrative practice programs, tell you a bit more about our school and our alumni, many of whom are exhibiting and taking part in CXC this year. Lauren? Thank you, Dr. Korn, and welcome everyone to our CXC at CCAD Speaker Talk with C. Spike Trotman. I'm excited for all of our students here at CCAD to get to know Spike better. Her work embodies the kind of entrepreneurship and community building that we want our students to exemplify in their own practices. As part of our curriculum in comics and narrative practice, we encourage our students to look outside of traditional modes and methods of publishing. And no one embodies that better than Spike Trotman. Her 26 Kickstarter projects for Iron Circus Comics have raised almost $2 million. And Kickstarter named her one of seven Kickstarter thought leaders in 2018. Spike has taken that funding success and put it right back into the comics community, giving opportunities to upcoming writers and artists that they might not have gotten via traditional publishing platforms. Spike shows us how much she values her community by literally giving back to them with the proceeds of her campaigns. She makes sure that the pay rate, page rates for all of her creators go up as her fundraising dollars do. I'm also excited to have Spike interviewed by renowned comics auteur and co-founder and artistic director of Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, Jeff Smith. Jeff knows a little something about building a self-publishing empire with his comic series Bone selling over 8 million copies worldwide. And with that, I am proud to introduce C. Spike Trotman in conversation with Jeff Smith. Thank you, Dr. Corn and Lauren. Hello and welcome to CXC 2020 Saturday Night. This is the Columbus College of Art and Design Cartoon Forum. I'm Jeff Smith, the creator of the Bone Graphic Novels and the artistic director of CXC. Tonight's talk is with C. Spike Trotman, cartoonist, writer, artist, publisher, and Kickstarter extraordinaire. If you don't know Iron Spike, as she's known on Twitter, uh, you're in for a surprise. She not only publishes her own work, Spike has proven herself an impressive editor with, of anthologies with titles like FTL Y'all and Smut Peddler. Through the publishing company she created, Iron Circus Comics, Trotman's, Trotman seeks out creators who have been underrepresented by the mainstream. Recent releases from Iron Circus include Band Book Club by Kim Hyung Suk and As the Crow Flies by Melanie Gilman. We began our talk with her early days when she was printing up her web comics and going out on the road and, and tabling at comic book conventions. A rough slog as any indie comic artist starting out knows. Oh, so, I, so sometime after, after that, like in the mid 2000s, you started doing um, kind of these how-to books. And the first one mm -hmm. I think was Warcraft. Yeah. So now this is, this is you um, 
talking about, you know, you know, this is in my life. I'm writing down, this is how I'm surviving. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm sure it's part instructional, but I'm also sure it was part try to just deal yeah. with it and get, get it out. Yeah. It was a, it was a combination of, this is the book I wish someone had handed me when I turned 18, because it would have saved me a lot of grief and also almost kind of like organizing my own thoughts on the subject because yeah. I was, you know, at that point I had figured a few things out and I was looking back and I, I wanted to make sure that what, like the the life plan I was adhering to made sense. Like if I put this book out and had a piece of advice in it and I got a bunch of feedback that was like, really, what, no, you know, maybe that'd be good for me. Maybe I'd, that'd be helpful in some way. But primarily its primary purpose was a book like this should exist. I grew up reading Larry Gonick's books, which are Cartoon oh, yeah, History yeah. of the Universe. And yeah. so I was a big believer in the power of educational comics. Like I knew they worked. They're the reasons I got A in high school history, Larry Gonick. And I had this idea for this book. And I would tell people about, oh God, you know what? I wish I had an extra $10,000 lying around because then I, I would hire Diana Nock to illustrate this script that is pretty much already done and sitting there. And this is what it would be about. And I think it's a really good idea and blah, blah, blah. But the money doesn't exist. So whatever, who cares? But <laughs> it was around that time, maybe six months, 10 months later that I first learned of Kickstarter while literally sitting on a panel for a convention. Uh, I was on like a small press panel and one of the other panelists, a guy named Gordon McAlpin, casually mentioned a brand new site he had just found called Kickstarter. And I was like, what's Kickstarter? And he elaborated and I was quiet for a minute and I was just like, cool. And I went home and I looked it up and I was like, this is perfect. This is exactly what I was looking for because at that point, I had an audience, I had people who were into what I did, but the kind of money that was in web comics was something that I, uh, to this day, I referred to it as secretary money, but quite frankly, that's probably generous because I'm sure <laughs> secretaries made more than I did doing like 20 cons a year and selling collected editions of my web comic. Mm. But what's important to note that those collected editions came about because I was already crowdfunding. We weren't calling it that, that word didn't exist, but I was already crowdfunding before Kickstarter existed. And uh, I, was, I wasn't I was alone in that. A whole lot of webcomic people were doing that because this was- Oh, how, you know, how? Tell me how you were yeah, doing it. Yeah, this is like the naughties. It's important to like everyone, we're taking it back here. This is pre-Patreon, pre-Kickstarter. Um, when people were printing their, their collected editions of their webcomics, what they were doing is they were making, hand making in, in Photoshop, because again, pre-Clip Studio Paint, pre-Manga Studio, uh, making these <laughs> graphics that were thermometers and they, they'd stick them up on the top of their sites and be, hey everyone, it's time to make a collected edition of my webcomic. I, I got the quote from the printer, it's gonna be $5,000 and here's my PayPal. Uh, the, the book is gonna cost $12, so PayPal me $12 and OG, I don't know, $5 for shipping. And every day uh, I will manually update the, the thermometer graphic. And when it hits $5,000, hooray, I'll print the book. And if it doesn't hit $5,000, well, we just won't think about that, you know? And yeah. sure, I mean, I did that. Uh, all my friends did it. People just funded their books that way, even though technically it was against uh, PayPal policy. And there were cartoonists who lost their PayPal accounts for years for doing this because you weren't allowed to have a certain amount of time elapse between taking someone's money for something and then delivering. Like there, there was a finite time between those two periods. That's and probably if, a good idea though. Yeah, oh, sure. oh yeah, it is, <laughs> but like- Cause I know problem, a lot of cartoonists that, yeah, yeah I they, mean, they get the money and they're gone. They're, yeah. Oh God, tell me about it. But it's like, if you, like pre-sold, pre-ordered your book to a hundred people and one person was got irritated with you and reported you to PayPal, that could be the end of your account. That, that Because people were a lot squirrelier about online payments back then. And hey, PayPal are, had, a, yeah, they were much firmer well, about their policy. You want to, I'll take you back in time. <laughs> I did, I did a crowdfunding thing that was even before the internet. Oh. Yeah, and this was like in 92 or 93, and just as Bone was starting to get a little attention and I was starting to talk to other cartoonists, and I met uh, Dave Sim, who did Cerebus, 
And, you know, and I was, I was still very much struggling. And mm -hmm. he said, what you need to do is you make a print, you do a really nice drawing of your characters or some scene, and you only make a hundred of them, but they're a hundred dollars a piece. Oh. So, uh, and, and, and you advertise them in your book. And I think Dave might've let me advertise it in Cerebus as well, which would have been very helpful. I, but, um, that so let me do the math. So that's like ten is that ten thousand dollars? Did I get that right? A hundred times a hundred? Sounds like ten thousand to me. Well, I sold them all. And I was mm -hmm. I made ten thousand dollars. And the, I've only seen one of them in all these years ever go up on eBay. So oh. and this and I didn't even have Photoshop. <laughs> I <laughs> I had to use chart pack to make yeah. them, to do the letters pages and anything written inside okay go ahead i'm sorry that's more that small business no, no. ingenuity though juicy put up the slide about the kickstarters oh there's uh, <laughs> poor craft ah. so you were doing these little books i i bought these on your website they're like oh $2. no don't do that <laughs> <laughs> this is everything i know which uh i love this i thought this was oh, very God. it was basically uh it didn't really tell you how to make a comic it just told you yeah. about all the shitty things that will happen oh, <laughs> yeah. If you try to make a comic. And then, of course, then you did the next one, which is uh, let's kickstart a comic and not screw it up. You want to know what inspired this one specifically? Absolutely. At the, at the very, like, maybe first two or three years after Kickstarter became a thing and it became clear this wasn't some fly-by-night thing that was going to disappear tomorrow. It was just picking up steam and becoming more established and a routine was kind of being established. Um, I started seeing these things because, you know, the Google Panopticon knows what you're doing at all times. And Kickstarter kept coming up, obviously, and all my, where I was visiting online. So I began getting served all these ads. And the ads I was getting served were like, Kickstarter master course with person who has funded nearly $10,000 in projects, you know, just $800 at the downtown Sheridan for a three-day intensive course. And I was like, $800? <laughs> to, to, to fund a Kickstarter. Hell with that. I'm going to just put together a little comic and charge a few bucks for it. Because, you know, there's no way that I, I am like viscerally offended by people who take advantage of people because they are filled with hope and they don't know where to start with something. I don't know how, if I'm putting this in the right terms, but a lot of people look at, look to Kickstarter especially creative types as the only means they're going to have to be heard in the world. Because I'm, I'm, as I'm sure you don't need to be told, it's rough out there trying to get the attention of publishers. And it's especially difficult if what you make is air quotes, not marketable. And a lot of people who make web comics make stuff that they've been told over and over again, is it marketable myself included? And yeah. so they feel their only option is crowdfunding, but Maybe they're 22, fresh out of college, they don't have an audience, they don't have a portfolio of work that's been published, and they want to run a Kickstarter, they want to be heard, they want to make something that gets out there and finds their audience for them, but they're terrified they're going to launch a Kickstarter and it's going to fail. Like, first things first, a failed Kickstarter, not a big deal, I swear to you. Anyone who's watching this who is terrified of launching a Kickstarter because, oh my God, what if it fails? It's not the end of the world. But number two, the thing that bugs me a lot is folks who are peddling this idea that there are cheat codes to life. And a lot of these people peddling this whole, I will help you fund your Kickstarter. I get emails from them to this day because every time you launch a Kickstarter, you your inbox is just filled. It's flooded with emails from these people who are preying on hope who are just like, oh, I have a secret list of backers who who will absolutely fund your Kickstarter, but they, they'll never see it unless you give me $50. Like, and that's oh. essentially what the email breaks down to. And it's gross. No, and that's, uh, that's suspicious I, right yeah, there. Yeah, I hate that. I hate that. But yeah. the thing is people fall for it because they, they, they're worried about what will happen if they don't reach for this, you know, this, this chance. But well, you know, I've, I've yeah. something I've kind of picked up from, um, from you, uh, and what I've read about you is that you do have this kind of like desire to help people. You don't want to just do it yourself. You want to let people know how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. you have this, you have a, a history of actually like 
uh, trying to elevate people whose voices are not really that heard. And that's going to come up towards the end of our interview. So I don't want to talk about that yet, except okay. for um, just this Kickstarter thing is like, you're, you're the wonderkin. How did, <laughs> I mean, what's, I mean, are you, are you still, do you still like talking about it? Or are you oh just God, like, no, I love talking about Kickstarter. <laughs> okay, sure. I love it. No, cause it's like, it's this really, it's a beautiful democratization of access to audience and for good or for ill editors in sort of like the modern publishing landscape have become strictly optional and everyone's got an opinion on that. And a lot of those opinions are totally valid, whatever, but it's worth remembering that a lot of what editors do is thoroughly subjective and mm. iron circus has been founded and prospered on publishing things I have personally been told no one wants and will never sell. A perfect example is Poorcraft, which is before, prior to getting international distribution. I moved 16,000 copies of that graphic novel by myself via online sales, exclusively online and convention sales. And I stopped counting at 16,000, you know? Good. After That's that, great. It, it just felt weird going on. That is fantastic. That's really yeah. good. And Pre that's very not impressive. Digital sales either. Yeah, and I'm I'm really proud of that. But that is a book that when I initially offered it to Diamond Distro, they told so me. Could, oh, I'm sorry. Finish. Yeah, finish. They, yeah. The, I I offered it to Diamond Distro, and they told me it's like, yeah, we can't sell this. And I was like, oh. well, I I ran into that obviously, and, and I'll bet my you solution, did. My solution. For like, what? Who's going to do bone? Nobody. Everybody looked at it and told me like that doesn't. That's a silly thing. Yeah. Um, so self publishing was it. I, you, you, if you if you have your idea, and you're committed to it, it's your art. It's yeah. your art. And Absolutely. everybody in this audience, because we're being watched mainly by uh, art students and um, and the like. So hi hi guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, you you know what we mean by that. So. Uh, let me uh, let's talk about your 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 big. I don't know. Is it fair to call it your big breakthrough? Your big Kickstarter <laughs> breakthrough. Uh, Smut peddler. Is it oh Smut yeah, peddler? Smut peddler is probably the reigning the reigning king of books. People insisted nobody wanted. <laughs> uh, it was basically I I sat down and I made a wish list of artists that I would love to see draw porn, and I emailed them and I was like. <laughs> hey, so I'm putting together this sex positive anthology and it's going to be very consent driven. And I was wondering if you wanted to participate. It's just like, yes, just, I'm going to just immediately bang, 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 bang. I got all the answers back. Like, obviously, yes, definitely, definitely. Really? That's, yeah. that's amazing. That's it's fantastic. Like these, people, these people have been waiting by their inboxes for someone to ask them to draw dirty comics. Well, and I, I like <laughs> that you called it uh, sex positive because I'm going to read yeah. the, uh, the uh, subtitle, which is, uh, impeccable pornoglyphics for cultivated ladies and men with exceptional taste. Yes. That and is we have, great. That's a great tagline. That's really yeah, good. And we have like expanded beyond that now. Smut peddler used to be primarily, we would, we used to have gender requirements. We now currently do not have gender requirements for smut oh, peddler, I, but. Oh, I'm amazed. Yeah. Cause I kind of was interested yeah. in that, but okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. So cause yeah. I know from watching your YouTube videos that for, at first you did have a gender yeah. requirement. It either had to be by a woman or a woman had to be on the team. Exactly. That was that was extremely important because, quite frankly, it was to stem <laughs> the deluge of really terrible porn. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. we got some bad, bad submissions. And they were by guys who were like, okay, so I read the rules, but... You know, I'm special. It's like, no, you're, you're genuinely not. I can tell you this right now from your submission. And it was... Like a lot of things I do, Smut Peddler was actually pretty reactionary. It was, I liked reading dirty comics, but a lot of the dirty comics that were available were not super comfortable to read. They yeah. they were sort of, they, they surprised you with really objectionable content or they didn't, as far as I was concerned, focus on the right things or seem to even remotely care about the woman that was involved. And that irked me, that annoyed me. And Smut Peddler was kind of a challenge to that because that was sort of like the overwhelming majority of comic smut that you you could easily find. And, and Smut Peddler- 
and not just in comics, but in all of porn. It's, yeah, uh, absolutely. It was. Just, it's almost unwatchable. It's not fun. It's just. Yeah, it's really yeah, not. It's like. It's yeah, uh, and I I did think that was groundbreaking. It's it's amazing. Mm-hmm. I I I because I mean, well, as we as we entered into talking about porn, it reminds me of a Saturday Night Live bit where uh, Seth Meyers was the boss, and he at Christmas would have the shelf elf come sit on his desk. <laughs> Yeah. And the shelf elf would tell him, you know, things he saw people doing. <laughs> he says, oh, oh, oh. The shelf elf says, you know who watches porn? No, who watches porn, shelf elf? He goes, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. and, um, but but and so, I, well, your book was, I, I thought, mm-hmm. was a bombshell. Because oh, thank you. It was, it was fun. It's fun sex. It's a, 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 the women are, want, are there because they yeah. want to. Everybody uh, wants to be men, there. Or the two women or the two guys or whoever, whatever you've got going on in the story. Yeah, exactly. And it, that's that was really important to me that everybody who was there acted like they wanted to be there and they were happy to be there. And they were like, yes, let's do this. And it's honestly, in, in retrospect, it's kind of sad that that's so rare. You know what I mean? That uh, our selling point is everyone involved wants to be involved. It's like, oh God, that's really sad. I would, uh, I'd like to point out the art that's on the screen right now. Um, and I lost my note about the name of the artist uh, and the story writer. But this is a, go back one jersey, please. That's that because uh, this is a, so there's a lot of science fiction besides mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's just people meeting in real life in kinds of stories, but there's a lot of science fiction in it. And then this particular one, the artwork was just really blown my way. And there's, I can't, my glasses are good enough. Will you read her name for me? Uh, Spike. I can't even, it says Lisa. Liza. Liza Petruzzo. Petruzzo. All right. Liza Petruzzo. So the art in this, and, and I looked her up. She's, she does like erotic comics online. Mm-hmm. But go through this. Okay, so the, the science fiction element is a, the, while she's asleep at night, a, 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 a meteor lands. The next morning, she goes down to the water's edge to bathe, and she sees someone. Now, look at – no, go back one. I'm sorry. Go back, Jersey. So look at her. So she sees something moving, and look at that bottom frame. Look at her that face. Yeah, that, is, that, is a, that is a heck of a good drawing, a good cartoon <laughs> drawing. Yeah. Uh, and you don't expect something like that in, you know, erotica yeah. or whatever. Okay, so go there. on, so forward. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is the alien that's there, and she learns mm-hmm. on the next page that anytime they touch, she he could become more like her, or she could change him mm-hmm. into being more human. And I, I was not able to go very far. There's just a couple, only a couple more pages. That's it. That's the last one. <laughs> uh, but here she's like, so she's like, oh. I have a little more control here. I can turn you into, and like she, she just touches them and gives him the hair. And now he's nearly human. And the next page is <laughs> very, very titillating, but I could, I was afraid that that was a little too much in a, in a public forum. Yeah. Um, I so, think there's uh, this, there's this attitude and I've seen it like literally articulated, just written in plain language on the internet where, People just go, oh, well, you know, it's porn. It doesn't have to be creative. It doesn't have to be, you know, outside the box. It doesn't have to be interesting. Just draw people fucking. That's all people want. And it's like, okay, cool. Universalizing your own subjective desires, but you are objectively wrong. You know, (laughs) it's like there are people who do appreciate context for their adult comics. And there are people who appreciate context for their adult stories. Exhibit A, walk into literally any bookstore and partake of the entire wall full of pornographic books that, you know, respectable women walk in and buy every day with Fabio on the cover. That's yeah. literally porn. That is just... Ah, <laughs> I, I've never read any of that. So I, oh but yeah, I'll- romance novels yeah. are some of the filthiest smut that oh. you could imagine. They are unbelievable. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, well, anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm get you into the, uh, I know I could talk about porn all day. I know oh, yeah, I, think, yeah. I was getting ready for this interview. I mean, I am, uh, I'm actually doing an interview tomorrow with Jimmy, uh, Pagliotti and Amanda Connor. So oh, this whole week I marked out for reading porn and <laughs> Harley Quinn. That was my whole week. I was like, I, I, I love my job. <laughs> Um, but you have lots more besides uh, oh, yeah. besides the and so um, 
so is this where you started getting interested in anthologies? Because anthologies would be, I would think would be difficult. Uh, anthologies so are way more difficult than publishing a, a single creator book. They're, whoa, it's like cat herding scratches the surface of how hard it is. And part of the reason I still do them, because I say this all the time, I say this whenever I'm like super frustrated and like Iron Circus is having its, you know, coordination meeting with, you know, publicist, editors, et cetera. So it's like, I don't have to do this. I could stop doing this tomorrow. We have enough single creator books. But the thing is, I don't think I will because anthologies are number one. I'm a publisher. It's super important to me that I don't fossilize into one of these people that only publishes folks who are like, around my age you know what I mean people who are of my generation and I have no clue what 20 year olds are doing I don't ever want to be that publisher and a really great way of seeing like what's out there what's new who just graduated who just decided to take a crack at comics is going through my anthology submissions because I have gotten submissions from people and I've written them personal emails that are like whoa like we can't have you in this anthology because we just straight up ran out of space but wow, your stuff is great. If you ever want to pitch a straight up graphic novel to me, let me know. And I wouldn't know that person was alive if they hadn't submitted to the anthology. So like, it's awesome. It's, it's like having sort of the, the, the first line on all these people who are really eager to make comics and are really eager to have their first published work. And also, um, I really like the idea that a person who is new to comics again, maybe not even necessarily super new, but a person who's trying to maybe make a professional living at comics can go to a convention and have a 20 or $30 book on their table because that makes a world of difference. When I was just starting out in comics, I had that sort of stereotypical table that just had, you know, stickers, postcards, prints, and you know, $1, $5, $10. Sure. Okay. But then when I started having books, Suddenly, I was, instead of hoping for like, you know, a $5 sale or a $3 sale, it was a $12 sale, it was a $15 sale. And that made a world of difference. And it, frankly, it makes me feel good that there are people who get into Smut Peddler or any of my other anthologies, and they get to go to conventions and have $20 and $30 books on the table and actually make a profit and come home from the convention and pay the light bill or buy groceries with comic money. That's an mm. incredible boost. Well, you're talking right now to uh, probably a large number of art students, and CCAD, Columbus College of Art and Design, is one of the, one of the few uh, universities or colleges, I suppose, that uh, has a program. Uh, in comics. I think it's specific. It's more focused on the writing, but uh, they have a group uh, called Spitball where these the students actually make uh, an anthology and it's super impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so uh, so here you, you're now talking to these students. Uh, go ahead and tell them it's okay to be into comics and tell them, you know, give them some advice if you can. Right now, this is the best imaginable time. By some accident of timing, by a alignment of the planets, you are making comics in the best time it has been to be making comics in North America in living memory. If you wanted right now, you could go out and you could start pitching to companies that would have laughed in Jeff and mine's faces just a decade or two ago. The idea that someone who is making comics can now pitch to Random House and HarperCollins and get multi-book deals with six-figure advances, not saying this is going to be you, chances say it won't be you, but it's happening, it's possible. That was unheard of when I was in my 20s. What was also unheard of is if you don't give a crap about publishing through HarperCollins or Random House or any others of these really big deal companies, you can go get a Patreon and you can work that up to something that pays all your bills doing exactly what you want without editorial interference of any kind. You can just find your audience via social media, via art sites. Again, Webtoon was not a thing. You know, all these other places, there were, there were sites that comics were on when I was in my 20s, but the monetization route that is all laid out didn't exist. There is so much flexibility and there is so much access to potential audience right now that your timing could not be better. <laughs> and if, th if this is something you truly want to do, if you want to give this a crack, if you want to see if you can make a living making comics, 
I say go for it. I say go for it, but at the same time, have realistic expectations and understand sort of where you are in the ecosystem of the scene. Um, it's fantastic. There's so much possibility. It's not going to be easy, but it has never been easier. So, okay, okay. We just got worried that we're getting towards the end here. Um, I, I just want to add to that that... Uh, it's, it is really, it is a good way to go to try to do stuff on your own it's through the web. Uh, get out to shows. I mean, I know we can't do that right now. And in fact, I, that's one of my, one of the reasons we established CXC was to help young people and get new people in there and have new people meet master cartoonists. And we've done that every year. We get, the, we get someone who's brand new and pretty soon you see them in the Billy Ireland or something <laughs> looking at artwork and chatting. You know, you also have uh, Art Spiegelman talking to Rafael Rosado who does Monsters Beware. And they're having this intense conversation about, about some art. It's really cool. Uh, it makes you very happy. So getting out, out there and doing work is probably step one. And if you do want to talk to a uh, random house, that kind of thing probably requires a lawyer but an I'm not a, lawyer, a lawyer and an agent exactly mm -hmm. um, but having some work under your belt and work that's good and work that you believe in that's that's one of the most important things yeah. so if we're getting down to the wire here i want to say to everybody um stick around because after this invitation there's going to be a live q a all right and you can really you can just really ask um uh, ask us anything. So, uh, but before that, let's, I, there's a couple of books that you have published uh, <laughs> that are fantastic. Uh, oh, uh, my! F the, I I read this one just yesterday. It's called mm. the Band Book Club. Yeah, that one and is I, actually yeah. It's it's oh, if I can. Sorry, it's just basically it's another one of those miracle of timing things, and. It's going to forever be the book I put centrally when people are all like, oh, social media is useless. Like, no, Band Book Club exists because of social media. And that is because I am friends with Ryan Estrada, who's one of the co-authors. And he began tweeting one day about, you will not believe what my wife, uh, Hyung Suk, uh, you will not believe what my wife just told me. She told me she was at a Band Book Club in, in college. And like, we've been married years. And she, she, she never mentioned this before. And I tweeted at him, I'm like, oh, that should be a comic, dude. And the next thing you know, we made it into a comic and it's a memoir, it's real. Um, it's probably been the most surreal experience I've had of 2020 because it's, I, I've, um, I've sold the licensing rights for it to be translated into Korean and published in South Korea, where it was, last I checked, outselling One Punch Man. And it's <laughs> like one of those deals where it's like, Anything I had anything to do with outselling One Punch Man is not a thing I would thought I would experience anytime soon. But I can here top, we I can, are. I can top that. I've never even oh, yeah. heard of One Punch Man. I don't even oh, know what that is. Oh, it's on <laughs> Netflix. It's it's honestly it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Okay, but um, uh, well, can, I would like to uh, Jersey. Go ahead. I picked out a one quick sample because this is something that startled me, uh, and I'm going to have to get close because my glasses. I can't, I want to read this to you. This is, uh, this actually takes place like in uh, 40 years ago, not, or 1983. The 80, yeah, in, 83. In, 19, in um, South Korea. And there's a lot of student protesting going on. And the government um, had years before had slipped uh, out of democracy and into pretty much tyranny. Um, and they, but, you know, so they get these kids, they join a, a book club and reading only banned books, but they get raided. And like in the top picture here, you can see them trying to escape the the raid and there's tear gas coming out. And the last panel, which isn't actually, it got cut off here, but they're like pouring water in their eyes, just like you see now, uh, like either in Hong Kong or here in the United States. But I wanna, if I can read this, I really, can you read that Spike? Sure, which panel do you want me to read? The, the second panel. It goes, well, uh, Hyung Suk is saying, how can Chun, who is the dictator, how can Chun trick everyone? H how do people not see what's happening? And the guy she's with says, he doesn't care if we believe him or not. He created such a divide between the people who believe his lies and those who don't that the country is too torn apart to come together and properly oppose him. That froze my heart. Yeah. 
yeah. That is, there you go. That's what, that's what sliding out of a democracy. Yeah. That's, they all that's, use the same playbook and it's yeah. mildly horrifying how effective it is. Yeah. It's pretty bad. Um, and then let's, I'd like just to ask you about this one last book here before we go. It's mm -hmm. called As the Crow Flies. Ah, the yeah. And Melanie's actually uh, an exhibitor at CXC this year. So, oh, cool. uh, so anyone watching this, please go to the CXC website and go to the exhibitors. And you can actually click through um, and see what deals she has. You can actually go to her website uh, and see what she's got. So yeah. yeah, so talk about this. How did how did you choose uh, this this project? It was pretty easy. Um, first of all, it's beautiful. There aren't a lot of cartoonists currently, um, and if you know of any anyone out there, send them my way. Who are working in colored pencil, and certainly not this masterfully. Melanie absolutely knocks it out of the park with their colored pencil work, and I, I follow them on instagram and sometimes they'll they'll post sort of what's left of the colored pencil after they're done with it and it's this little pathetic nub like you're wondering where they actually grip it to draw <laughs> but it's beautiful and it's so i'm i'm shallow aesthetics are important and the thing that draws me into a story first is the aesthetics so when i first saw melanie's colored pencil work i was like oh my god i have to keep going and then the story is something i'm really fascinated by because uh, in case anyone hasn't noticed, hi, I'm black, how are you? And I grew up in a mostly white suburb. And the story is about a girl who is dropped off at a Christian summer camp. And she is the only black girl at the Christian summer camp. And she's sort of kind of going through this whole thing where she's almost like hyper aware of like, okay, okay, when is, when is the other shoe going to drop? When is this going to get super uncomfortable and fucked up? And the problem with being sort of the only black person in the room in a lot of situations like that, and quite frankly, this is not exclusively black, like this happens to a lot of people who are marginalized, like the only woman in the room, the only queer person in the room, the only disabled person in the room, the only um, autistic person in the room. This can happen in a lot of ways where something just sort of happens that is like, it, it brings into high relief how you are not being considered in the current conversation and it just sort of sails past and before you even decide whether or not to address it it's gone it was three minutes ago and that happens a lot in the as the crow flies and while it's like it never puts it in these exact terms at all one of the things that also drew me to it was it has a very strong undertone of second wave feminism versus third wave feminism because one of the conceits of the camp that Charlie, the, the girl, is attending is that it is a Christian summer camp that is based on a tradition that was come up by these frontier pioneer women who would have a Christian retreat in the mountains every year. And they would go up there to pray and sort of reestablish their, their relationship with God and so on and so forth. But the thing is, Charlie is sitting there looking at all this and listening to this story going, okay, cool. Did they take their kids? No, they didn't take their kids. So who was looking after their kids? Right. Okay. The slave women who are not included, but we're literally not even going to acknowledge that, are we? You know, so it's like, it's, it's, it's that got that level on it. And also there are other things which I do not want to go into because it is literally a spoiler where it also sort of comments on how there are people who they think of themselves as progressive and challenging of sort of casual prejudice in social relationships who are actually themselves not quite as progressive as they think they are. And not wow. going into detail because you should just I, read it. It's yeah. <laughs> I feel good about I feel good about this, Mike. It was really <laughs> nice. Thank you so much for, oh, thank uh, you for coming here and talking to us tonight. It's um, a thrill to talk to you. You're uh, fucking amazing, dude. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> but I want to thank I want to thank all the um, I want to thank CCAD. I want to thank uh, all the staff there uh, who have let us do this. Let us uh, be part of their um, their event for CXC. Um, I want to thank Lauren McCubbin, who uh, arranged this uh, with you. Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, thanks, Lauren. I think Lauren's going to be moderating our, um, our Q&A afterwards. So again, everybody, stick around. Uh, and afterwards, there's going to be a live Q&A. Spike, 
Thank you. Thank you.